happy to speak to you today, Jim. My name is Jacobine Das Gupta. I'm Director of Sustainability and Lead for the Nutrition Cluster. And in this role, I have the privilege to work with innovation marketing around our company, Royal DSM, a B2B company that is the world's leader in micronutrients ingredients. And we work with people who are into human nutrition science, animal nutrition science, as well as sustainability. And combining all of those makes us an actor that really wants to change the world of food systems. And what is this all about? This is all about bringing back nutrition in the food. It's more sustainable production of all kinds of foods and also reducing food loss and waste in different value chains. And I'm pleased to talk with you today a little bit more about the value chains of the different forms of dairy. That's great. And I think that it wasn't that long ago, at end of September, that we had the first International Day of Awareness on Food Loss and Waste. So I guess it's something that is as important to consumers now as it is to companies, governments and organizations. Yes, absolutely. And it also, I would say, identified as a key lever by World Resource Institute, uh, the FAO. It's really a shame that one third of all the food is lost or wasted from the field to the fork. And uh, we also know it's the equivalent of 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And if food waste were a country, it would be the third emitting country in the world after US and China. So it's not only a big spoilage, it's also a huge opportunity to meet the Paris Agreement. And that's also why I truly think it's something we should act upon. Maybe to add, as you may know, COVID-19 also have made matters worse. It's even up to 80% in some regions due to labor restrictions, export restrictions. And uh, so it's even becoming a more prominent issue that uh, I believe everybody should be involved in. And how much of the of what we see in terms of food waste and food loss is associated with the dairy industry and in what ways? Well, the UK agency RAP identified dairy in the top three of the most lost and wasted food and beverages. And so it's really high. And um, the UN FAO says between 12 and 25 percent, depending on the region, of dairy is lost or wasted in some form. In Europe, probably about the lower side, say 12 to 15%. And it's actually lost in bits and pieces along the value chain. It's lost, for instance, at the farm or, or wasted because of contamination, uh, because of antibiotics that sometimes occur in smart parts, amounts of the milk, and then a lot has to be thrown away because cows are treated, against mastitis or other health. And this even costs about $32 billion a year. So it's at the farm where percentages are lost. It's also in the logistic and the production of the food, for instance, of cheese and yogurt. And another 5% is lost over there. We dived into it to see and to unpack it and to see what can we do about it. And we learned that it's due to batching errors, cleaning fats, it's also errors in ingredient labeling, or disapproval of milk quality, and also in cheese, for instance, when uh, cheese is cured. So different pieces where gains can be also found. And at the retailer, another 2 to 6% is wasted, and that's slight imbalance. Purchase management, but also shelf life expiration, and at the consumption site in Europe, no less than 9% of yogurt and cheese is wasted because the consumers find the taste or the looks not so good anymore, or the date is expired. So there is also a lot to be won. And um, that's also why we are keen on understanding first the amounts and the reasons, and then also to see what can we do about it. You mentioned a lot of different things there and a lot of different steps of that food chain. I guess there's not really any one size fits all way to address it, but what can be done to address some of those issues at some of those steps? Maybe give you three examples at one at the farm uh, with certain micronutrient solutions in the feed of the cows. These diseases like mastitis and other health can be magnificently changed. 
and uh, resulting in even up to 50% less losses. In the production, there are solutions that make it in the curation of cheese, for instance, that there is less mold forming, so the crust is less thick, and also extending shelf life in retail and at the consumption side is really important. And we know that if you have seven days of longer shelf life, so that you can put the expiration date seven days later, you can also reduce 20% of waste at the consumption side. And this can be done by natural cultures, for instance, in, for instance, in yogurt. So that makes something really tangible and measurable. And how can DSM help directly with some of these issues? All of the above. <laughs> Actually, internally, as, you, as I stated at the start, we have a very strong base of scientists food application and nutrition and sustainability. And we split it into three levels. We call it improve, enable, advocate. So what can we do ourselves in our own canteens? We apply new technologies to measure food waste in canteens and bring it down and see, for instance, with pilots, such as clear the plate in China. And for instance, that particular pilot already resulted in 25% of food waste in our own canteens. This is, of course, perhaps more symbolic, but important. What we call enable is there's where our scientists and innovation managers come in. And here is where we provide feed ingredients, such as vitamins. Here we also help provide cultures to help food producers of yogurt and cheese to do the processing as uh, resource efficient as possible. And where we help with extending shelf life as we call it, DelvoGuard is one of the biopreservatives, is an element that you can add to the yogurt and to ensure it stays safe, nutritious, tasty, and extends the shelf life. And last but not least, we also try to advocate for food loss and waste. And maybe you've heard about the World Resource Institute Champions 12.3. It's a group of senior private sector leaders, heads of state, and civil society and we are really rallying for halving food loss and waste, SDG 12.3, bringing out case studies, encouraging everybody to measure and also to reduce and setting also own targets. So we really try to ingrain it in people's minds uh, and thinking. And we are actively searching for solutions, working with partners, and we also advocating for uh, reducing food loss and waste as a very important means to feed the world. And you mentioned cheese earlier. I wonder if you could expand a bit on some of the solutions that you have that would help in this area. In the production of cheese, we all know that taste is everything. It should smell right. It should look right. And actually, some omissions in this are actually the reasons why people at the consumption end throw away cheese. So it really needs to stay well and also we try to avoid some losses in the production. So we have three solutions in different types of cheeses that help to be more efficient and prevent losses and waste. The first is so-called pack age. It's a cheese ripener solution that prevents the formulation of mold in hard cheeses. So think about Parmesan and Gouda. It's a membrane solution and it's used in hard to see hard cheeses and it protects while it's ripening in the ripening process. And we know that if all Gouda and Parmesan cheese would be ripened with this solution, it would save around 200,000 tons of cheese every year because the mold and the crust is less thick and doesn't need to be thrown away. And we also know that it's the equivalent of 6.2 million tons of CO2. And this is exactly the reason why our customers are interested, because it's less throwing away of cheese, but also significant reducing their carbon footprint. As many of our dairy customers set targets on this, science-based targets for greenhouse gas emissions, or even go further and want to go to net zero, this becomes a critical element. And a second solution is Delvo cheese. And that's used in mozzarella. And we know that the yield is up to 1 to 3%. It's uh, helping to slice it better. And 
And the slicing means that the reducing cutting losses are 15%, and that is an equivalent about the carbon footprint of 12%. We really have this type of solutions that altogether make it more efficient and help in the process that due to less cutting, due to more easy ripening, at the end, you're left with less waste. And are there any other examples? The production side has been not given enough attention. There is quite some attention also by the European Commission on reducing food waste at the consumption side. But upstream, there is a lot of to gain, like at the farm, like these micronutrients feed ingredients that can help bringing down mastitis and other health and really, really can make a significant reduction. It's also doing tests and antibiotics in milk, as we offer as DSM also the Delvo test, that also helps to prevent contamination. We can do a lot of some resource efficiency at the farm and in the early stages. And in the production side, I think we simply should not accept anymore that we have calculated in 5% losses. If we are a bit more careful and we start to see food as the precious food again as it is, and not something that you should easily or could easily waste, we can make magnificent steps. So I would pledge for all farmers, food producers, and retailers to be very critical about every step in the chain and don't let opportunities uh, slip. So really stepping up the game and making sure that you know what's happening and asking for help. And there's many companies that start to be very aware. They set also targets on food loss and waste. And we are very keen as DSM to help with our animal and human nutrition and food application solutions to do whatever it takes to reduce these losses and waste. And dairy is a value chain where there's a lot of uh, losses. It's the mozzarella cheese, the gouda, parmesan, uh, and so on. It's yogurt. But there's also other value chains like meat and juice and eggs. And also there, and that goes uh, beyond the purpose of today's interview, uh, we can do a lot with different interventions. So don't think we are there, I think the technology and the processes can still make a big step up to uh, to get this amount of food loss and waste down. There are lots of companies and lots of governments and all of them have targets and some of them are way into the future. Is 2030 and food waste of reduction of 50% achievable by 2030, do you think? It is achievable, but it's all hands on deck. And... It's all hands on deck for the food producers to take this very seriously and do not accept this couple of percentages loss, but bringing it down. It's also new innovations that are needed for better data management and tracking and tracing. It's not all there. Not everybody knows exactly what the losses and waste are, and then you can't improve. So you need to measure, and then you can manage. And I also call upon the, the governments to include this in their national Paris Agreement equivalent, so the nationally determined commitments, NDCs, reducing food loss and waste is an excellent way to bring down the greenhouse gas emissions. So it will not happen automatically. But if the producers and if the governments and also the citizens feel responsible, it is achievable. Earlier, you mentioned about the food waste in terms of it being the third biggest behind the US and China. How are we able to address some of those regional variations in food waste, especially as it relates to dairy? Because obviously some countries produce much more than others and some have more efficiencies than others. That's correct. And what you see is that there are proportional differences. In Northern Europe and North America and Europe, there is 61% of the waste is at the retailer and the consumption level. So there is relatively smaller amounts of waste in at the farm, at the production, and so on. But Southeast Asia and Africa, it's the other way around. There we see much more waste 
on the field, uh, the crops or perhaps livestock products where that go to waste on their way to the factory or to the retailer. So it is needed to really have a regional approach, depending where proportionally there is most waste. But there are some cross-cutting and valuable solutions everywhere. And I have to come back here also to the measurability and traceability. If that's more visible, if more people start to see what's left on the field, what doesn't reach the food producer or the factory, and what's left at the consumption, I find it, for instance, a huge amount, 9%, that, that's left over at the consumption side, there will be a change. And on top of that, there is new tracking and tracing, as new technologies that can inform farmers, that can inform food producers. Uh, where is all these perishable goods? Where are the, the livestock products and the crops? And by having better monitoring and better measurement, we can make significant steps, and that's across the globe. So to bring it back to We Make It Possible initiative of DSM, this is our statement and our invitation to change the livestock sector from within. So all the solutions and initiatives um, that take place at the farm in livestock products, such as dairy, meat and eggs, we have bundled and we call it We Make It Possible because we can amplify, we can help to have the animals in best possible health and well-being, but also to reduce the environmental impact. And with this growing population, and both animal and plant proteins are expected to grow, we will need all interventions to bring down the environmental impact. And food loss and waste is a huge intervention and a huge, has a huge potential in this broader context. So linking back We make it possible, initiative to invite others to reduce the environmental impact of animal proteins and food loss and waste being an excellent lever for that.